We haven't been together for one and a half, two months. This is the third and final class that you'll have with me. It's a two-day workshop. Now, has anybody, Dr. Murti or Vianney, explained the difference between a normal course and a workshop? Yes, no? No. All right, let me explain the difference because it's important that you understand. A workshop is designed to give you very specific tools, whereas a normal course is trying to make sure that you come equipped to understand general concepts about a field, whether it's international finance, or whether it's uh, project management, or whether it's supply chain, but you're not really expected to end that time in the course with total mastery. You're not supposed to be an expert in all the details of that field. Whereas in this workshop, we've taken something very narrow, very specific, very precise. Your thesis. And that thesis is in effect driven by a 42-page document called Master's Thesis Manual. You all have that document? Okay. So that in effect becomes your textbook. And it's the set of expectations that MSM has for you for how you should go about doing your research, how do you format this document, what are the various numbers of pages, what does a bibliography look like, everything that they expect so that if you did it perfectly you would have a very high chance of an excellent grade. You still have to have your own mental input but because it's very specific and there's very little room for arguing about this is someone's opinion, this is someone else's opinion, this is what one school of thought does, well this is the way they do it in Japan, this is the way they do cost accounting in England, it's MSM has a 42 page document and in that document the university says these are our standards, these are our expectations, you must meet them. So, because it's very specific, we just spend our time making sure that we are equipped and trained to do what they want. Okay. So it's got a very different focus. We're not trying to cover a lot of material. I'm not drawing on examples from all over the world. It's not that kind of an exercise. For whatever reason, they call that a workshop. So it's a thesis writing workshop. It's a two-day exercise. We'll spend the same four hours per class that we've spent together in the past. Although, I have to confess, because I haven't taught this before, this way, I don't know if the material that I'm asked to cover is really going to fill up four hours on each day, or if I'm going to end up scrambling because I'm running out of time, or if I'm going to say, hey, it's 8.30 and I'm done with everything I wanted to cover today. I'm not quite sure. So you're sort of my guinea pig class. I will teach this again, both here and in other countries. But since I've never taught it this way before or anywhere, I don't know exactly whether my own estimate of how long certain discussions will last and how much time things will take is accurate or not. So you'll have to bear with me as we experiment a little bit together. So as a workshop, it also doesn't have the same ground rules as the courses that I've taught for you before I've had. There, you've had an examination with 60% of the grade for the course, 20% of your grade for the course being class participation, and 20% being a project. This has none of those elements. There is no final exam, there is no project, there is no grade for your participation, other than that you have to be here. So, you, there's sort of a requirement that you be present, but whether you talk or whether you don't ever talk will not affect the outcome one way or the other. So the course is actually a pass-fail course. So you can fail it, but you can't improve your grade based on anything that you do in the course. So it's purely how motivated you feel to participate, to pay attention, to ask questions, to make sure things are clear. It's truly for your benefit in a way that some of the other courses might not have been in quite the same way. There, you could have actually had a strategy of saying, well, 
I'm already doing well enough, I don't have time to work on this course, I'll just barely pass. That gives me time to do other things. Here, I mean, you have a pass-fail strategy. So if you think you're doing well enough to pass, more power to you. But if you guess wrong on the wrong end of pass-fail, you could very quickly find yourself in some danger. And that then doesn't become an issue of me saying the person wasn't a good student or didn't make a nice comment. It's a question of were you here, were you not here? And that's where the attendance sheet sort of doesn't lie. So being here is definitely in your best interest. It's only for two days. You're, you're lucky I let you in. I let you in late. Don't think that you didn't disrupt me and don't think I didn't notice and don't think that I'm not unpleasantly surprised. I thought that my saying be here at six and don't be late would have been clearly understood by you. Why was it not? What about be here at six or don't come in do you at this point with me as your teacher not understand? I'm sorry. That means you don't understand. So, so far are we together? It's a workshop, it's not a course, it's pass fail, you really need to be here or MSM will tell you you have to do this again, I guess. I don't know if we've used this projector before. It seems kind of yellow to me rather than bright white. I don't think I can do anything about it. Is there a special lens covering this thing or something? No? The table. It's the table. The table. Behind oh, the table. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, there you go. So I have to stand like this all, all evening if I want it to work right? That's technology. Let's see. This is Rafael Owino. He's the webmaster for SFP. He's filming the class as kind of a technology experiment. As you might have heard, we even filmed live sort of through a uh, YouTube type feed graduation last Friday. And his next new trick, his next innovation, no, I can't have that in the middle. Okay, that's all good, thank you. Is to do a, a prototype of recording classes so that people who either didn't catch everything or want to go back over it or want to be able to review before an exam can have not only the notes, I'll do what I've done in the past and post these notes. I'll post the notes like I've posted in the past. They'll be on the website right after the, well, I mean, tomorrow morning, not right after the class, but tomorrow morning the notes will be on our webpage. Our webpage location has changed a little since our last class. Because on 1 June, the new website went live. And the location of some things on the new website is different from in the past. So, um, Raphael, can you tell them actually where this is located? Okay. Um, as opposed to going to sfb.ac.rw, you'd go to mba.sfb. Dot AC dot RW. Okay. And then what do they find? Uh, so you'll find the MBA site, then you'd go to program structure. Where you'll find a list of all the courses. Then under uh, core courses, you'll find this is writing workshops. So one of the core courses will be called writing, uh, Thesis Writing Workshop? Yeah. Okay, so then you'll get to the title of this course. And then once you get into our course, you'll find both a soft copy of the thesis, the master's thesis manual from MSM, in case some of you didn't have it. I've already posted that there. And you'll find going forward, well, there's the course outline is already there. Any of you who were very motivated and managed to find this location before we told you about it, 
the course outline is already posted. And it's worth taking a look at it because although some of the background items will look familiar to you from other courses I've taught, the course objectives and what are the learning objectives, what are the expected outcomes, the list of topics and themes covered in each of the days could end up being a useful review tool for you even later. And it has in the course outline your homework. So you'll need that. I'm just reminding you, I, I have a hard copy of it here, but just as a reminder, the best way for you to keep up with what's going on is to go to the course outline, which you'll find by going through those steps. And for tomorrow, there's actually a, a small homework assignment. So, course outline, the manual, and then I'll, at the end of each day, also put the slides that I use. So, even after the second day, you'll have those slides. This is not material that you'll later cram for an exam. It's material that I hope you'll find useful enough that as you go forward into the writing of your thesis, you'll say, this is going to be helpful material, let me go back and refer to it. So, it's purely for you and to make your work as solid as it possibly can be. So, as we get started, I've got some updates to this document. I was given by Dr. Morty the schedule for your timetable or your deadlines for various deliverables associated with this thesis. I said to him, this doesn't look right because it's saying that your defense of your thesis comes after the graduation date for 2013. As soon as I saw that, I said, these dates don't make much sense to me. Can you revise them or tell me if I'm missing something? Are these people not going to graduate next June? So he said, ah, I made a mistake and he's just given me, you saw, some of you saw him in the room here at the beginning. So he's given me an update. So I think what I'll have to do is post this update as a separate document. But I can tell you, we'll just go through it a little bit here. So today and tomorrow you can still see is our workshop. Then, instead of 1 November for submitting your proposal, it's 1 October. And then 15 October, you're going to get your supervisor assigned rather than 15 November. 17 October, rather than 17 November, the research proposal gets forwarded to the supervisor. Then, what might be a little confusing to you is where it then says research proposal presentation in here. That's totally wrong. What happens is the proposal is presented after you've got approval from your advisor that you can go forward, that you're ready to present it. The idea of that presentation is that it allows us on the faculty to get some deliverable from you before the day you hand in the final thesis. If we wait till that last day and haven't given you an opportunity to get feedback from us, we could end up with a disaster on our hands where you thought you were doing the right thing and you were doing totally the wrong thing and now it's really too late to do anything about it. So MSM has said, let's have them put their thoughts down in writing so that those thoughts have to be evaluated formally at a particular date. That way if they're misguided we can put them on the right track, get them going in the right direction and send them on their way versus waiting until May when you submit your final document. I'll give you that in a minute. And then find out that you've done the wrong thing. So after you have forwarded your proposal to your supervisor, and I'll explain in a minute how the supervisor gets selected, then that research proposal pre presentation is the next date. Even now what Dr. Murti has given me is he said January 2013, but he has said that's a, it could be January 1st or January 31st, and it's flexible based on how long it has taken you with your supervisor to come to an agreement that you're ready to now present that proposal. Some of you might get it right very early on, in which case you're given the green light, you're given the approval to start your research as early as November 1st could even happen. So it's in your interest if you want the final product to be good or if you have taken on something ambitious to get your approvals as early as you can because that allows you then to get started with your real research. Remember, if you're presenting your proposal, you still are at the point where your, your hypothesis or your topic 
might not have been fully approved. And the advisor might say, ah, I'm not convinced. Ah, it's not really original enough. Ah, you haven't gone into enough depth. There are all kinds of things that you could get by way of feedback where you're forced to tighten up your proposal before you're told, now you can do the research. The faster you get past that stage, the faster you get into conducting research. Conducting research should be finished under the new schedule, which I'll give you, by the end of January. So your research should be finished by the end of January. Because you need to start your writing in the beginning of February. And according to Dr. Murti's new schedule, the writing takes place during February and March up until 15 April. So you will submit your final draft, if you will, on 15 April. Now after it's been submitted on 15 April, it has to get reviewed by your supervisor. And usually it's going to not just your primary supervisor, but to the two or three people who have already been identified who will be on your jury. That's going to be a mixture of people from SFB and people from MSM. And people will fly in for your actual defense. Now your defense will happen, it says here, April and May. Or maybe it's April or May, because I think he doesn't know the dates yet. But in order for you to graduate in June, and the 28th of June is the graduation date for 2013, we need to sort of backwards plan and say, when do we have to have already gotten the grades in so that we can alert MSM so that they can provide a transcript, so that they can come with a set of graduation diplomas so that you are fully represented on graduation day. If we don't get that right, if we don't have the presentations and the defense early enough, we can't then say, this is how well the person performed in the defense. They can't get that information to MSM in time for them to turn that information into final transcript, final diploma, that then gets sent by DHL or FedEx back here in time for us to give it to you on graduation day. So that's the timetable we're working with now. One other piece that I want to explain is the part about supervisors. So what I find is a little odd but it's the way it's done here, is before you get your supervisor, you will come up with your thesis topic. You'll come up with a theme. You'll come up with a topic on your own, without the help of a supervisor. Your supervisor will be assigned to you. This is different from a little bit of what I will brief you on, and it's different from what you'll find even in that thesis manual, where it says, try it work with a professor who has interests the same as yours, or who you like, or whose style is similar to yours. What I have just found out today is that basically it's not something that you control. You will submit your proposed topic to Dr. Murti. He collects all of your topics, sends them to the Netherlands, and then a decision is made that 50% of the advisors, or supervisors, will come from MSM, 50% from, from SFB. And all of the staff of both MSM and SFB will take a look at your topics and say, okay, that one's in my field, that one's in my field, I'll take that one, based almost 100% on how close that topic is to their academic interests. So what I thought is that you would have some say. In other words, if one of you said, Ah, Professor Whitlock, I know that your PhD is in transport economics. I wanted to do something in trucking between here and Mombasa. Can you be my supervisor? I don't get to say yes or no in the way that you think I do. You can approach me, but I basically have to say to you, it's not something that you can lobby for. You can't ask for me. There's a, a process that happens at a higher level where based on maybe what my PhD is in or based on other <coughs> theses that I have supervised, I'll be given maybe a banking topic, because since I teach banking here, they would say he's the appropriate person for banking. Project management, nope, we won't give that to Whitlock, he hasn't taught project management before, something like that. There's a system that will make sure that no one is under or overweighted with a certain number of theses. Part of why it's done that way is to make sure that somebody who is very popular 
doesn't end up having to be the supervisor for eight, while somebody else gets zero. So I think it's partly designed to try to balance the workload of the instructors who are involved. They also seem to know, I, I don't know how this is done in the Netherlands, but they seem to know far in advance who's going to be flying to Rwanda to be on the jury. I think already they may know this. So they say, these five people will come. Let's make sure that we assign in light of who the five Dutch professors are or international professors that are coming from abroad, what fields do they represent? So that's just to give you some background on how that's done. So you will have created your earliest draft, if you will, of your proposal, your research question, your title, and you'll have submitted it to Dr. Morty before you even have a supervisor. Then you'll get a supervisor. Your supervisor is assigned, and that research proposal of yours, which you've submitted 15 days before you get a supervisor, is forwarded to that supervisor electronically. It goes off to the far ends of the planet, wherever those professors live or work, and they now are told by MSM, this is your advisee. This is the person you're going to be supervising. So the teacher, sitting in the Netherlands, now gets an email that says, here is the topic and sort of the research proposal of, you know, Miss Esperance. And that proposal will be reviewed for the first time. And it's at that point that the advisor will say, your topic is too broad. Or, this has been done 20 times, there's nothing new in it. Or, you'll never be able to finish in the time you have because going through that much research will require a full year of manipulating SPSS data. Something like that. You'll start getting some feedback. You will then have to respond to the feedback, narrow the topic, choose a different topic, come up with a different approach, use a different methodology, have a larger sample size for your questionnaire, whatever it might be. Depending on the kind of feedback you've got when he or she sees your proposal, and then you'll respond. Hopefully, it will only take one back and forth. So you submit, the professor will give feedback. And if the professor is doing his or her job, there will be some feedback. It won't be perfect. So you'll get some guidance, do this, do that. You will do what the instructor or what the supervisor asks, and the supervisor says, it seems fine. So if that all happens quickly, as early as the end of October, remember we're not using those dates, we're using the dates on this revised sheet that I just was reading from. As early as the end of October, you can already have a green light to start your research. And then you're going into full-fledged research, not in this period, forget those dates, but as early as end of October. So you could conceivably have end of October, November, December, and January, all for doing research, and then schedule your presentation of your research proposal very end of January to give you maximum time to have already conducted some early research and done some literature and some background reading. Then, having passed that hurdle, you go into your writing starting in February. Do that from beginning of February till 15 April when you hand in what you have written. And then from that point it gets reviewed and then you're going to come for your defense and then the defense plus the written work get graded together jointly and then you're given a final grade based on both. That's more or less the way the system works. What are your questions? Yes, Gerald. I'm trying to do this without name tags. I think I remember everybody's name, but if I don't, I may go back to name tags. Uh, when you were about to maybe to get a supervisor, uh, this one of course someone thought, if maybe you told us maybe uh, supply chain management. And I just want to be a course and supply chain management. Now, uh, uh, does it require another uh, some other steps again to Again, to not be given that, that chance to maybe to access you. This was me. You see, what you're basically trying to do is what I just said they don't want you to do, which is you're lobbying for a particular instructor. Hey, this, this teacher who I had before, I like her. I want her to be my supervisor. And what I've been told is that you really don't have the luxury of doing that. Now, what is probably true is that if that person is at SFB, you can make a deal. The reason it would work if the teacher you particularly want to work with is at SFB, and if you approach that person quickly before he or she gets assigned anybody else, is that 
unlike the ones who are coming from the Netherlands, you know that the person who is based here is going to be here at the time of your thesis defense. So that when Dr. Morchi schedules that defense, he just says, okay, Professor Reed, can you come to the room on Friday because Gerald Butera is going to be having his defense. It takes nothing for me to do that. If you said you wanted to work with uh, Mr. Steve, Professor Steve, the guy's got to fly here from the UK. So you see, if you said he was my favorite teacher, I really want to work with him. And if he is not one of the ones that MSM has scheduled to fly here in May for thesis defense for the jury, they will not approve that person. Because they say, we're not going to pay for an extra flight just for him to be there. They want to make sure that the person who is your supervisor is also on your jury. Because that's in your best interest. Remember, your jury is made up of three people. One friend, two enemies, basically. Okay? One you've been working with every day, very closely, knows your work well. The other two are brought in one week before and are told, read the finished product. You didn't supervise it, you gave no input into it, but you're going to have to grade it and you're going to have to ask detailed questions to this person during his or her defense. Those people are not your friends. The only person in that room who is your friend is the one who was your supervisor. Because if you have a weak document, a weak thesis, at the time of your defense, your advisor is just as much to blame as you are if it's weak. Because that means he or she hasn't been giving you enough supervision, enough guidance, hasn't been reading it carefully. And the other two are going to start even yelling at the third one, who's your supervisor. And the defense gets very nasty very quickly. You'll get a bad grade, they almost insult the, the supervisor. So that's why we can't have a supervisor who you say, I like this person very much, but who's not on the jury. It's really important that you have that one advocate who's on your side in the room. So that's, that's how that system works. We want to make sure that you at least have one friendly face in your jury, in your defense. And that's the supervisor, because the other two are hostile. They don't know you, they may have never met you, they haven't seen how you struggled and sweated to do the work, they just pick it up two or three days before and read it the way they would read a newspaper. Then they sit in there and they say, why should I let you pass? It's a very high tension environment, you need to understand that. So, having that one advocate who's there on your side is important. And it's important also to try to establish a good relationship. I will tell you, having been an advisor of classes uh, or intakes three, four, and five theses already. So I've been through this. I've been the advisor to a number of people. I've been on the jury for a number of people. And I've even just sat in as an interested observer for a number of people. So I've done it a lot. And what I can tell you is that sometimes when a person is assigned a supervisor who doesn't work out well, for whatever reason, maybe the supervisor doesn't like your topic, doesn't like you, is having a divorce at that time and just can't concentrate on your work and gives you no feedback, anything could happen. But if it's not working out, I don't want you to think that you are locked in. I don't think it's written anywhere in the manual where it says you can petition for a change of supervisor, but you can. And the time to do it is here. You will give your research idea to your supervisor. You've already been working on it for, say, I don't know, a month maybe. And then once you get a supervisor, you're going to say, hi, you know, my name is Estelle, you've never met me before, but here's my proposal. And if that person just says, not good, looks fine, or just gives one word answers, or takes a month to even reply, reply at all, a month that is precious for you, you need that month to graduate. My advice to you, and it's not written in any of these manuals, is petition immediately for another supervisor. Because your careers are, are on the line there. And if that's somebody who doesn't give you good feedback, or doesn't give you fast feedback, it could end up harming you further on when you're saying, I can't start writing until I've already gone past this research proposal, and I can't do that till you give me a green light. You won't even give me any feedback. And I've seen just students in tears over this. So don't wait and say, maybe he'll get better, maybe he'll become my friend. As soon as you see the, sight, the slightest sign that this person is not taking it seriously, is not taking it as seriously as you are, petition for a change. 
and it has been given. I've seen it more than once. Basically, MSM said, wow, if the student feels that strongly about it, we don't want to have any kind of a problem where they just later say that they petitioned and we ignored them, let's try and make them happy. So if you, if you do petition, you will almost always have your petition rewarded with a, new, with a new supervisor. So that's my advice to you on that. If you get one that's working out well, fine. Don't change. And I will also just advise you, the fact that the advisor or your supervisor hands you back a draft that has lots of red marks on it and lots of crosses does not mean that it was a bad supervisor. That's a good supervisor. That's one who took the time to really read it with a lot of care, a lot of attention, a lot of detail. I, I, I joke sometimes that there's sometimes as much of my red ink as there is the student's black ink when I, when I supervise. And for someone who's not used to that, who's used to just seeing a, a check mark on the top of the page, they see what I give them and they start to cry, literally grown men crying, because there's so much red, it seems demoralizing. But if you just realize, I'm in this too and I'm trying to make your finished product be really excellent, and we've got to start somewhere. I'm not saying I refuse to work with you. I'm saying this is what needs to be worked on. If I refuse to work with you, that's different, but I'm there to work with you. So me as an advisor, I'll just speak from my own situation. I, I take it very seriously. I look very meticulously at every sentence, every line. I don't scan and then just put check marks on the top of the page. I read everything. And I'll say, wait a minute. This is a repetition of what you said back on page 19. And I'm on page 40, but I'll go back. I'll say, I know I've seen this before. And I'll even find it, and I'll tell you what page you did it on. So it's helpful when you get somebody who is willing to take that kind of time with you. Your final product, you'll be so much more proud of it that it's worth it for you to realize that the supervisor who gives you detailed feedback is doing you a favor and is not out to make you feel bad or insulted or ridicule you. That's not the intent and that's not the way it's designed. So, are there questions on anything about the supervisors or the timetable? Yes, sir. You know, on the timetable, uh, the last course we'll be having to be from the 8th to the 13th October. That's uh, management of procurement, depending on the specialization. Okay. Uh, I'm asking, uh, I think that Dr. Mood made this timetable uh, term based on this because the master thesis comes after the last right course. after the last course ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but with uh, the new, the revised uh, timetable, it seems like it's becoming it's called, uh, it's like becoming a bit early. So now you would actually have to start doing the research while you're still in a course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem or, or is that something that you can live with? Yes, Steph. Like we can check, like the timetable Dr. Muti sent us, not that one. I think it's the yeah, one. Yeah, it might be this one. Uh, so this one. But, but this one has submit research proposal, which means it's already being submitted to SFB and we send it on to MSM on 1 October, mm -hmm. which is when that, that last course, I don't know what the course is, either hasn't started yet or is in progress. It's before. The, the course is starting the 8th. Okay, so that means. Well, then that's not so bad. It might mean that between the course that would have been happening in September and the one that's happening on 8 October, during that period is maybe when you should be already thinking about working very intensively on your proposal so that you can submit it on this deadline of 1 October. I think that's really the way it's probably intended. How much time is there between the course that ends right before the one that starts on 8 October? And now, when does the one before it end? Uh, <coughs> the one before it's, it ends on the 15th uh, September, and okay. uh, the, the other one on 8th, it's like a, probably uh, three weeks. Okay, so you, have, so you have three weeks in there. You won't have those three weeks to work exclusively on your proposal because you may have to take the final exam for that course yeah. in that, that three-week period as well. And depending on how the teacher organizes the course, you may even have your project for that course happening in the three weeks too. I don't know how you will be using those three weeks. I don't know what those courses are. But your point's well taken that you may have to really clear your calendars of other personal obligations during that time right at the end of September, knowing that you're going to have an important deadline on 1 October for submitting that proposal. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Joseph. I would like to know whether the supervisor can 
ask you to revise or change the topic. Either. Mm -hmm. Revising means you get to keep the same topic, but you need to either tighten it up, change its focus, change the methodology. You know, if you said agricultural development in Africa, the person might say, well, how about you make it agricultural development in Rwanda, 1970 to 1980? You know, might say, okay, the idea of agricultural development is fine, but your topic is too huge. So that's not quite the same as changing your topic. He's not saying, make your topic uh, dredging the deep water port in Dar es Salaam. You can still keep agricultural development as your topic, but you need to really narrow it down. So that would be a revision. A topic change is if you said, I want to do a topic on the beautiful designs of Rwandan baskets. And the advisor says, that's not enough about business. That's more about culture, handicraft, but it's not really, the, the approach you're taking just isn't enough about business. I'm not going to let you go forward with that. Find another topic. So either could happen. A revision could happen, or a change of topic could happen. Or you could be just told, that seems great. Stick with what you got and go straight ahead. Either one could happen. Yes. On that point, what if you submit like three, three topics and then the advisor chooses one? Is it possible? It's a lot of extra work. Because you're not just writing down a simple sentence saying, here's my topic, here's my title, if you will. You have to give more than that. You have to say, here's why I think it's important, here's why I can tell you that this has never been done before, here's some early reading that I've done to show that there's enough literature in this field to really allow me to go deeply. Do you want to do that three times? I mean, okay. Probably out of three, it will be easy for the supervisor to choose one and say, do this one. But you've done an awful lot of extra work. My advice to you would be to take one that you're really excited about and passionate about and put all your attention into that one and make that one proposal really good. Studies, they look at the global thing and maybe uh, on local scene. And then you choose all those topics basically. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'll go exactly into what kinds of topics make good sense. So we'll, I'll talk more about that. And if at the end of my having talked about it, you're still not happy with my answer, remind me and we can come back to it. But I think we'll actually cover that. Other questions on this? No. Okay. Yes, Odette. So when I just said any more questions on this, you decided you would sweep them and that you would raise your hand afterwards? No, my hand was up. This was what your idea of a hand was. <laughs> yes? So I wanted to ask what if I take my topic in the materials topic, which I wrote on, and then you take I go it on, deeper. Ah, and you go deeper? Yes. Is, you're saying, is it allowed? Is that the question? So I asked this. One of our friends, when they were starting MBA, could ask us the topic we did in the bachelor's degree. So like mine was Dr. Thompson, but then I asked, why did you have to ask me this? Say that at, at times you can go deeper into this topic. So I wanted to get more on that. It's possible. And it's an interesting question that you raised. And here, I assure you that between different supervisors, you will hear different points of view. If you came to me, I mean, I mean, if I was your supervisor, and you suggested doing that, I would probably discourage you from doing it. But there are other people who would say, no, for you to become a real expert in that field and to go deeper, that's a good thing. You'll be the best known expert in that field if you go deeper. I think you should do that. There are others who will give you absolutely different advice from me. What I believe is that you benefit by having several different areas of competence. If you studied something in geography, let's say at your bachelor's level, and did a, a kind of a thesis or a senior project or a final year report, and if now you do something which isn't in geography, but is more in finance, now you've got some tools in geography and some tools in finance. And both of them will be useful for you in your business life, in your future careers. If you just stick with geography and go deeper, now you know a lot about geography, but when some issue dealing with finance comes your way later in your career, 
you haven't had the experience of doing detailed, in-depth, sophisticated, original research on a finance topic. So you're an expert in one thing, but if something even slightly different from that field comes your way, you have to turn that opportunity down. So I would advise you, if you were my advisee, to broaden yourself so that you would be a well-rounded scholar who could do things in more than one field. But I'm also letting you know that there are other instructors who have a very different philosophy about that and like the idea of going deeper. So there it might just depend on which, on which advisor you got. If you got one that said you can't go deeper and you really wanted to go deeper, I would then petition for a change. I would say, I'd like a professor who'd like, who, who will let me go deeper into this field. I'm excited about this field. I know something about this field. I have a contact network that's already in place in this field. I want to do that. And I think you could make that case and probably win the argument and get a new supervisor in that case. Other questions? No. Okay. So, the value of this thesis. Some of you might be saying, wow, this is a great opportunity. I get to do some original research. I get to spend a lot of time on the computer. I'm going to have something that's written that's mine, all mine. And some of you are rolling your eyes up in your head saying, I just want to get out of this place. I just want to get out of this program. One more hurdle, one more mountain I have to climb. I'm just counting the days. And you're hating this. I don't know if all of you are in that second category or some of you are in the first. but. This is a culminating experience. Culmination, if you know that word, it means sort of a crescendo at the end. That's called the culmination. The finishing point when we bring all the pieces together. And it's integrating the coursework from a number of different fields. The people who are evaluating you know what your curriculum looks like. So if you have learned how to use statistical tools or how to do a discounted cash flow or a net present value analysis, and they look at your thesis and they see, this is ripe for that kind of an analysis, but you've chosen not to use it because you don't really like quantitative tools or you think it'll take too much time. They will say, no, 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 no. You have to use all the tools that you've been learning in this program. Where is your net present value analysis? So the exercise has to be integrated. So no matter what kind of a topic you choose, your supervisors will be expecting you to integrate the various skills and perspectives and subject matter that you would have accumulated at that point through all of your courses. So that's something to think about. It's integrated. Next, you're going to give back rather than just take. Up till that point, you've been absorbing knowledge that the instructors have been sharing with you. You've been basically on the receiving end. With this exercise, you're being told, we trust you enough, we think you're mature and sophisticated and knowledgeable enough that you can give some new knowledge to the world. You're not going to take it from someone else's mouth or from some other textbook. You're going to disseminate it. You're going to create something new that no one has ever seen before. An insight, an idea, a theory that no one's ever seen before. And you're going to argue it convincingly and articulately enough that it becomes the standard and other people will learn from you. Now, for scholars, that's exciting. That's what scholars live for. The challenge in an MBA program is you have not chosen careers as scholars. You're kind of in this middle ground. You're not just practitioners, because just practitioners are people who are out in Juakali, entrepreneur activities. They don't go to school at all. They say, I'm just going to figure out how to be a business person. You're saying, I want to learn how to manage in a structured, formal, academic setting. So you put one foot into academe. And I'm telling you, in the world of academe, the way you are measured, the way you are promoted, the way you are rewarded is based on new knowledge that you create and disseminate. Nothing else matters. New knowledge that you create and disseminate. That is how you are measured. But that's for people who decide to be professors for a living. That's for pure scholars. You're not pure scholars. You have day jobs. You're doing things out where you're making money. You want to try and make more. You might want to be an entrepreneur. You're running in a division or a department in a government agency. You're working in a bank. You're working in an organization. So you have very real world needs in terms of how do I make this relevant and practical. 
And how am I measured? You might be measured on profit that you bring in at the end of the day. And your bosses might not care that much about the new knowledge that you create. If you were in a program in philosophy, if you were in a program in history, you would write a thesis about some historical incident. You don't have to worry about whether it's relevant or practical or is going to bring in more revenue, or increase your company's market share, allow you to pass the next audit from Rwanda Public Procurement Agency. You don't need to think about that. You just have to learn everything there is to know about that one narrow topic. That would be a pure scholar. The pure business person is just trying to make sure that he or she can pay the rent. Can I make some profit? I just want to buy a car. I just want to pay that down payment for my house. And if I can sell more sacks of sugar, then I'm better off. You are between those two worlds. Your life is tough. You are in some of the toughest positions that a person can be in because you're being measured partly by the practical applications of your insights, but also on not just how they can make more money or help an organization to function better, but on them being new and original and creative. So you need to see that you work in both of those worlds. Final thing is what I call exercising all your muscles. You need to be using all of your skill set. When you're doing the thesis, it's not just one. You're not just getting better at writing. You're thinking, I'm writing a thesis. But you're not just writing. You're doing research. You're getting good at that skill of writing a questionnaire, designing a questionnaire so that the questions are not ambiguous, designing a questionnaire so that the person answering it doesn't say, I know what she wants. I'm going to give her the answer that she wants instead of a truthful answer. A lot of times people answer questionnaires saying, if I answer it this way, and they're asking, am I poor or not poor, I'll get more money from SPAR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell them I'm poor, even if I'm not. They answer the way they think they should answer, according to who's writing the design of the questionnaire. So you get better. That's one of the muscles that will get stronger. How to design a questionnaire that can't be tampered with by the people who are responding, that can't be second-guessed by the people who are going to fill out your questionnaire. Those people are called respondents. Okay? If you haven't seen that word yet, respondents are the people who answer questionnaires. And what do we call the people who ask the questions in a questionnaire? What are those people called? Um, that's one word. Interviewers, or we can call them enumerators. You'll sometimes hear that term. Enumerators. Interviewers, okay. Enumerators or interviewers. So those are the people that actually design and, and will go out in the field and do the interview and conduct the interview, or the interviewers, or the enumerators. So the other muscle that we flex, in addition to writing and in addition to research skills, is speaking. You have to defend this thesis. You don't just get to hand it in and say, I hope they give me a good grade. You have to stand in front of a group of people. And in case none of you have ever yet been in a thesis defense, let me just ask, did any of you go just to see what it's like to sit in on any of the ones that happened in the month of May of this year? You did. You did. Right. So the rest of you haven't ever been, I, I, I guess, in a thesis defense. It would have been worth it for you to have gone and sat in one day this past May, because that would have helped you prepare yourself psychologically for what happens when you go through it yourself next April or May. But in addition to the committee of the, ju the jury, if you will, the three people, you will have people who are your well-wishers and your classmates who just want to make sure that you're doing a good job and they're there to support you. And it's, it's open for anybody. Anyone who wants to learn about what you're going to teach, because now you're the teacher, you're the expert in that field, is invited. So there might be people from other parts of the university, other teachers. We hear about these things. I, we all, on the faculty of SFB, get the list of these are the topics, this is the time slot. Well, that one looks interesting. Oh, microfinance and why it's failed in Rwanda. Oh, I want to go to that one. I just choose them the way I would read an article in a newspaper. That should be entertaining. That should be interesting. Oh, I may learn something here. And other people, both students and teachers, will show up. Plus, you know, your spouse will show up just to give you moral support. 
Somebody who was in your study group when you were still in the classes will be there to help encourage you. So there might be 10, 12 people in the room. So if you're saying, oh, it's okay, it's just me talking to my supervisor, I, I won't be panicking. It sometimes creates a little bit more panic than that because you're giving a presentation. You're having to really be, like I am now, articulate, calm, comfortable, in control of the information, in control of the data, in judge of a group of about 10 or 12 people. And they don't just listen. The jury, after they ask their questions, will say, does the audience have any questions? And it could be a question you were never expecting, and you have to answer it. And that's the proof that you really are an expert in your field. That even a question that you weren't expecting, you think about it for a few seconds and you say, yes, I can give you a good answer for that. That's part of how you're graded. So that's also a skill that you'll develop, a muscle that will get stronger through this exercise. Final is called active listening. It won't necessarily be something that all of you get experience with. It will depend on who you are. If your thesis topic requires doing interviewing, this will be relevant. If you choose a topic that doesn't involve questionnaires and interviews, it may not be relevant for you. But one of the skills, one of the muscles that will get stronger is the muscle that allows you to hear what people don't say. When do they pause? When do they hesitate? When do they change what they were about to say because they think maybe that's not politically correct. Maybe that one will get me in trouble. And you need to be able to be sensitive to that because the thing they just changed is what you really care about. That's where the information is, for sure. If they changed it to make it sound politically acceptable, they're giving you the sort of the propaganda line, the official party line, what everybody wants them to say. You want to know what was that first thought you had that you changed. And you get better at hearing when people, uh, uh, almost in the middle of a sentence, will change what they're saying to make it more politically acceptable. And then you say, could we go back over that question again? Can you give me... And you go deeper in those areas. That ability to listen actively and hear hesitation, hear changes, hear uncertainty, hear fear. Who might be listening in on this conversation? I don't want to say that there's corruption in the ombudsman's office. If anybody can hear me, you will hear those things. You will hear them when you're interviewing. And it's a very useful skill in anything you do later in life. You'll be able to tell when people come into your office and they're lying to you. You'll be able to tell when people are over-promising but are absolutely incapable of delivering just by tone of voice, by what they say and don't say. And they choose funny language to say certain things instead of the most direct language. All of that you get better at. So that's an additional muscle that will get strengthened by doing a thesis. So all of that is good news. You're getting a good set of additional tools for your managerial toolkit. Next, I want you to think about what you've maybe done before by way of serious writing that would prepare you for this. I asked him, um, when back in March or whenever it was that we did global supply chain management together, I, I asked people to tell me their backgrounds. So I know I knew from that course what each of you does for your job. But I suspect that many of you have even changed jobs. You're not in the same job today that you were three or five years ago. So there could be a lot of change in what you've done. And somewhere along the way, you may have had to be part of a commission that had to write a study where you had to do a monitoring and evaluation report at the end of a project that you were a part of. Anything like that. Maybe your ministry is funded by a donor that requires quarterly reports. All of those kinds of writing exercises are training for a thesis. You need to think about, what else have I done that prepares me for what I'm about to do here? Is there any other kind of writing that has provided good experience? where I've had to do research. I'm not just giving my opinions, but I actually have to document. I have to go and do original research. I have to create a questionnaire and go out into the field. Before I even go into the field, I need to test my questionnaire on a small group of friends to make sure the questionnaire is really understood the way I want it to be understood. All of that, if you've done it somewhere before, draw on those experiences for this thesis. Don't put them in the back of your mind and say that's not relevant. They could be very relevant. Just like your bachelor's work might have been relevant for a master's thesis, 
There could be things that you've done in the workplace that also prove to be relevant. So think about them and think about what can I remember, what can I bring back, what can I dust off from some other things that I've done that could end up being useful. Then you have to ask yourself and be honest about this, how well received was the work that I did before? It might be that you've written something before, but that nobody read it, nobody cared about it, nobody liked it. They thought you were a terrible writer and you didn't change anybody's point of view. In that case, you need to realize that the fact that you've done something before is not necessarily going to help you excel on this thesis. The fact that you wrote something before and people rejected it and ignored it is a signal to you that you need to go about this in a different way. If you do this the way you did that, it's going to be equally ignored and equally ridiculed. And you want this to be excellent. Okay? So you have to be honest about that. Don't say, oh, everybody in my office likes me. Oh, they love what I work. They love my projects. Oh, all the time, they love me. Don't, think, don't kid yourself. Because you'll kid yourself all the way to the jury panel on the 15th of May when the jury says, see you next year. So you need to be ruthlessly honest with yourself about how has other work that I've submitted to people been received? Was it well received or not well received? Another thing that I'll tell you is that Rwandans in general, in my experience, are not particularly demanding in those settings. So if you had to write a report for somebody, they'll say, thank you very much, good report. And you might say, oh, they liked my report. But they hardly read it. They, didn't, they just skimmed it, or they didn't read it at all. And they're very happy to say, good report, and give you a good performance evaluation, but they never really read it. If you walk around believing that you're a great report writer because somebody said, good report, good report, go on, let's go to the next project now, it might be that they never really read it enough to know whether it was good or not. And you might be believing that you're good without ever having really been tested. And some of these supervisors from MSN and even from SFB can be tough. And all of a sudden you're getting this wake-up call, wow, I thought I was a good writer. I thought people liked my writing. And all I'm getting are red marks, red marks, rewrite, revise, go back, go deeper. And it can be discouraging. So you have to really be honest with yourself in terms of what feedback you've gotten in the past from people. And that goes to this third point about this standard. The standard that MSM is holding you to may be a higher standard than other things that you've written before, or other organizations in which you've worked where you have written things before. Their standard is pretty high. So even if you've done well before, if it was in a place with low standards, you can't think that having gotten good feedback from an organization with low standards is necessarily going to allow you to do well in this undertaking if this undertaking involves an institution that has higher standards. So when you're thinking about what you're going to be doing with your time starting 15 September, or earlier if you're very highly motivated, of course you realize there's nothing to stop you from working on this already from right now. And I'm actually asking you to do that in the homework for today. I'm asking you to at least take a first step, a first cut at a topic. And if you later say, I, I don't really want that topic. I just came up with that one quickly because Professor Reed made me do it. That's okay. The fact that you've had to think and clarify and put something down in writing already will help you later, even if you decide to change the topic. Yes? Uh, maybe I'll push you before this one. Uh, you mentioned about the fact that some things that I'm uh, necessary myself. And uh, it is about the experience. Someone has asked about what has been just doing. Well, someone can write it, uh, actually uh, maybe have a taste in that experience you have acquired. And again, I also, also compare it with uh, this course we are in this business. Actually, this is a, a business course we are doing, a business course we are doing here. So if your experience you are doing actually does not relate with the business courses, how are they? And I, I need to see whether my case can just get some maybe some weights when it is outside the MBA, outside the finance, maybe on the finance, for example. So that is actually my way. Okay. What I would say is that you are lucky 
in that Maastricht program is not called the Maastricht School of Business. It's called the Maastricht School of Management. Management is a broader field than business. Business, by definition, is private sector. Management can be just as much in the non-for-profit, in the faith-based, in the pub public sector government, or in the private sector. So I would be surprised if whatever you did couldn't come under the topic of management, even if it doesn't come under the topic of business. You see, you've probably managed things even if you haven't been a business person. You've had to manage budgets, you've had to manage people, you've had to manage events and timetables. You've had to manage even if you haven't been in business. And because you're submitting this to the Mastery School of Management and not to a business school, they're more flexible about the kind of background you bring and the kind of topic you choose than if you were writing this for Harvard Business School. Where they would say, that's not a business topic, and they might be stricter. So you shouldn't worry about that. They're pretty flexible in terms of what kind of a background you bring in that regard. So on this issue of research now, I'm trying to kind of nudge you gently out of the general why this is going to be an important part of your career in the MBA program, why this is the culminating experience. Now I'm taking you one step further. Now I'm saying, all right, so let's start thinking about what you would even want to even research. What would you even care about? What gets your curiosity stimulated? And one of the first ways to break that down is to be thinking in terms of basic research or applied research. Now this table, I don't need to read it for you, you can see the differences between basic and applied research. People whose foot is in this camp, who are pure scholars, are more likely to do basic research. People who are basically managers and are being asked to write a thesis, but in their heart they're managers and they're not scholars, they're not people who are going to do research for a living, those people are more likely to do applied research. You can obviously find some place where you're blending the two a little bit. Or you can, fit, you can say early on, right now, before you even start with your proposal, I like doing basic research. I like just digging and digging and seeing what I come up with. I'm doing the research and I'll come up with a theory, a hypothesis, once I've done some research. Or you can say, no, 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 I want to start with a hypothesis. I think that people respond better to negative than positive reinforcement in the workplace. And as a manager, I think the negative reinforcement, telling people where they're bad, where they're failing, is the best way to get them to improve. Not stroking them and saying that they're good. And I'm going to test that in my thesis. You start with a hypothesis. The other one, you're not starting with a hypothesis. You're saying, let me just observe. Let me see what people do. And after I watch them for a while, I'll come up with some ideas of how I think they're behaving based on what I've been observing. One is inductive reasoning, one is deductive reasoning. One is more basic, one is more applied. So as part of knowing yourself, because you don't want to write in a way that isn't true to who you are, that doesn't speak to your own passion, to your own experience, to your own interest. You want to write in a way that resonates with who you are. If you say, ah, I'm a more applied person, I want to write about a problem that right now has been harming my organization. We're trying to take salty water from the water table and turn it into fresh water because only with fresh water can we irrigate our fields to get the best possible coffee crop. But the water is brackish, there's salt in that water. And I want to figure out, it's, it's almost now a science problem. How do I take brackish water and turn it into fresh water? Very applied. Very much, the result will allow me to have bigger profits. The result will allow lower costs to be injected into my operation for my cherry washing station for coffee, something like that. At the other extreme, there could be something which you say, I'm not sure who used this, but I have an insight about human behavior and about how people are motivated when you give them negative reinforcement versus positive reinforcement. I don't know who used it. I don't know what organization will benefit from it. But I hope that somewhere, someday, someone will like my theory. That's basic research. So you need to get a sense of which you feel more comfortable doing, which you feel sort of speaks to your personality. <clears throat> so I just mentioned that so that you 
do a little introspection and think about it. Topic selection factors to consider. You should be choosing a topic about something that you're curious about, not something that you couldn't care less about. If you couldn't care less about the topic, it will show. When we read your proposals and your final paper, we're yawning as we're reading, because we can see that you're not excited about what you're writing about. So you want to take something that you're curious about. I really wonder if we couldn't somehow create a canal between Lake Kivu and Lake Tanganyika. Then we could have cheap sea transport all the way to Zambia, and from Zambia to the port of Durban, and that would be cheaper than using either Dar es Salaam or Mombasa. I want to do a costing exercise of that canal. That would be so interesting. And I live in Changugu, and I'm here from, from the western part of the country. That would help economic st stimulus and development because of all the construction, building a Rusizi canal. If it's something that is your passion, that you're curious about personally, it will make your topic that much more exciting for the reader. So you want to think about whether there's something that you wonder about. Could we ever build a canal that could go from Lake Kivu to Lake Tanganyika? What would that cost? Are there mountains in the way? Is there any reason why we couldn't do it? Was it ever tried before under the colonials and then abandoned? Could we maybe dust off those old architect plans now since the World Bank is willing to put new money into Rwanda? That's called an I wonder. I wonder if. I wonder what would happen if. I wonder if we could do, and then fill in the blank. You can find an issue that stimulates your curiosity. It has a high likelihood of being a good topic. Next, and this is the issue that you were bringing up earlier. Is it, a, is it an issue that's close to home, right here in Rwanda? Or is it an issue far away? Are you doing a topic that has to do with global supply chain in smelting of coltan, something that we dealt with in our earlier course, where we're taking a look at things that are going to smelters in Malaysia and then going down the supply chain and being turned into powdered um, products that are then compressed into components for cell phones and for computers that are being processed and value added all over the world. So do you now have an international study for your thesis? Or are you saying, you know, the case study of workforce development agency decreasing unemployment among females in the ages 10, I don't know, 20 through 25 in uh, Gichumbe in Rwanda. Very targeted, very specific, very narrow, very Rwanda. Both are possible. Here's my thinking on that. And once again, I'll tell you that it's just one point of view. If you have me for your supervisor, you'll have to deal with this philosophy, but there are other supervisors who don't look at it the same way. I think that you should be stretching yourselves. And I talked before about building up some new muscles. You are already Rwanda experts. Unless you've just come back from the diaspora, you're already Rwanda experts. What will make you globally valuable? What will make your credentials attractive to the United Nations, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, uh, the Rwandan Embassy in Singapore, is that you know more than Rwanda. Somebody who has lived in 17 countries and speaks nine languages, I'm telling you from my experience, you want to know more than Rwanda. Everything inside you is going to say, come on, I want this to be easy. Let me write about something I already know about. Every tendency inside you is going to be pushing you that way. Don't give in to it. That's my advice to you. And if I end up being your supervisor, I, I simply won't let you give in to it. I won't let you do a Rwandan topic because I want you to stretch. I want you to maybe apply what you know about Rwanda to another setting and do something comparative, okay? Or do something that has nothing to do with Rwanda. Learn about materials, learn about history, learn about how to find documents that have nothing to do with Rwanda. That will be so useful to you later in your career that as much as you will hate me today, you will all come back to me in 10 years and say, you know, Dr. Reed, that was such a good piece of advice you gave me because now I'm here in UN headquarters 
and I'm working on Afghanistan today, and Paraguay tomorrow, and Fiji the next day, and I can move between countries effortlessly because you forced me out of my comfort zone to do a project about a different part of the world, about a product that wasn't cultivated in Rwanda. Now, I thought it was crazy to do cotton since they don't grow cotton in, in Rwanda, but because I knew about cotton, I got this job with the IFAD in Rome, and they made me the subject expert on the cotton industry in Egypt, and I'm having a great time. I'm telling you, you will thank me later. You will also find supervisors who will say, sure, you want to borrow deep? You want to go deeper into what you already know? You want to work on a topic you've already done? That's okay. That will make you a subject matter expert. You already have some materials, and you'll get support for that. So I'm you know, when I'm telling you something which is a universal truth, I'll let you know it's a universal truth. When I'm telling you something which is just one person's point of view, I'll also be clear to let you know it's just one person's point of view. But more than one of you will end up having me as your supervisor, so it's useful for you to hear this point of view. Because I like supervising, so, you know, Dr. Morty has trouble getting people to agree to supervise because it's a lot of work. But from my point of view, I get to learn about topics that I knew nothing about, so I tell, oh yeah, 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 I'll take a couple, give me a few. I'm guaranteeing you, some of you will be supervised by me. So it's just good for you to hear my point of view also. <laughs> Whether you want me or not, some of you will get me. <laughs> what, why are you laughing? So that's an issue of close to home, far away. Both are working, both are possible. You can even do comparative studies where you compare a close to home phenomenon you know, the operation, the economic operation of tea plantations in Rwanda compared to tea plantations in Kenya, compared to tea plantations in India. You can do something comparative. All of those are possible. Yes? Uh, I'd also ask this question because you just said a lot of us and just talked about the uh, issues close to home, just as you like, just far away from home. Now, I was also just having uh, also this problem. If you maybe choose a topic on the now, I also ask myself, You're saying this is something you wrote about before, or this is your idea of what you yeah, think you want to write about? Not what East African community. community. Yes. Okay. Now, I also just ask myself, for whether this starts going to be a manageable search. So I will just ask whether to compare these two issues, being a manageable and uh, so I guess also be, 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 be being the one and be, be, be the money goes out there. That's going to close. So. You're stealing my closing remarks from tomorrow's class. The very last slide in tomorrow's class says, go narrow. It's just two words. That's what the whole slide is. It just says those two words, go narrow. Virtually every thesis that I've reviewed or advised or supervised or sat in on here since I've been in Rwanda is too broad. As a result, the work is too superficial. Even if it's interesting, even if the topic is a, is a topic that's never been done before and really captures my attention, it's treated too superficially to really be of much value as an academic document. Why? Because the person simply had more than could possibly be digested, more than could be mastered in the time that you have. Okay? I want you to think about this. You only really have maximum four months. Five, four? If you have November, December, January, February. Is that right? No, February you're already writing. So your research. Three months. You've got three months. You've got November, December, and January for research. February and March until April 15th, you're writing. So three months, 12 weeks for your research. A person who does a PhD dissertation spends up to five years. Okay? Five years. Your little three months is a joke to those people. So the kind of topic that you can successfully master Master, not dabble in, not skim on the surface of, master, has to be narrow by definition.
if it isn't narrow, all you'll be doing is treating it superficially. And all you'll be doing in your defense, when we say, well, what about this? You didn't go into that. Why haven't you handled that? Well, I didn't have time. Well, I didn't have time. And it's not going to impress the jury. I'm telling you, this is what I hear in every jury that I sit in on. That same argument. So your point is a very good one. And you might say, I'm really excited about doing something in the East African community. I'm not asking you to change your topic. I'm not asking you to dampen your enthusiasm. But maybe you want to say, you know, the impact of dropping the restriction on jobs so that now anybody can work in Rwanda, what has been the impact of dropping that rule so that now anyone from the EAC can work in Rwanda? Has that policy affected unemployment of Rwandans? Or are Rwandans still finding jobs? Or are they finding that they're unemployed and that Kenyans and Ugandans are taking their jobs from them? Something narrow like that, where you can say, at the end of my study, I can now tell you categorically, Rwandans are being affected. Jobs that used to belong to Rwandans, now 20% of those jobs belong to Kenyans. 16% of those jobs belong to Ugandans. Ministry of Labor keeps those statistics. Workforce Development Authority keeps those statistics. If we look in the newspaper at the job interviews, they're actually saying, if you're Kenyan, we're, we're particularly interested in you. There's a bias even in recruiting. You know, you can dig into that topic deeply and come out feeling like you really know a lot about it. It's an East African community topic, but it's narrow enough to do with 12 weeks worth of research. So you want to try and do both. Still stick with something that you really care about, but make it narrow. That's my last slide tomorrow. You're getting my punchline in advance, but I don't mind saying it more than once. Make it narrow, and when you think it's narrow, make it narrower still. You really need to do that. Next issue is whether it's doable. Is the thing that you're tackling manageable? Is it even practical, not just in the time you have, but with the resources that you have? And here's a list that I thought I'd share with you of some of the things you need to consider up front before you even commit to a topic. Because as much as you might be passionate, you need to put your potential topic to this test. If it doesn't pass this <coughs> test, you need to either reformulate it or come up with a different one. If you're going to have to do interviews, are the people you need to interview willing to talk to you? Oh, I want to do something about uh, atrocities during the genocide. Nobody wants to talk about those things, and you're not going to get cooperation. So you can't even say, what an interesting topic. This is really exciting me. Because you're not going to be able to get the field data that you need in order to do a sample size that is relevant. You might get one or two people to talk, but then people are going to say, you're trying to generalize and tell us about a, a theory that you want to make based on two respondents? Nah. You need to find something where people will talk to you. You need to make sure that if your research is document-based, that there are documents available. Oh, they were all destroyed during the genocide. Nothing exists anymore. <laughs> you better find a different topic. What are you going to refer to? What is your original source material if everything was destroyed? Uh, the documents are in an archive in Belgium. And then now I don't have the money to get to Belgium, so I just thought I would tell you that they're there, but I'm not really going to research them. We laugh at you. You need to have documents available. So as you're thinking in those early stages, I'd like to do this kind of a topic. You need to already be asking yourself, is there likely to be material available that will help me research this topic? And if the answer is no, because it's confidential, it's classified, it was destroyed, it's too far away, uh, you'd have to pay to get access to the data and you don't have that money, there are all kinds of reasons why you might not get access to data and to documents. But if any of them happens to apply in your case, you need to find a different topic. I just mentioned classified. Sometimes you might want to choose a topic where people say, that's still secret information. Yeah, when uh, the RPF, when, I mean, the Rwanda Defense Forces went in after the Intamahamwe people in, in North Kivu, even after they were told to go back to their own borders, yeah, we want to go and write about that. No, 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 that's classified. The government doesn't want even to have it known that it was doing those things, so it's not going to let you see those documents. Their documents might exist, but they're classified. You're not going to get them. And if you got them because you said, no, 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 I work in the Ministry of Defense, I can get them. 
I guarantee you that you're not going to be allowed to put them into your thesis for, MS, for, for MSN and SFB. You'd have to get a release from the ministry, which you wouldn't get. So you need to think about, will I be able to use material that's unclassified? If your thesis requires classified documents, you need another topic. So the next, is it culturally acceptable to talk about the topic? You know, I've been reading in the newspaper, I don't know how true it is, that there's a very strong anti-homosexual uh, anti uh, movement in Uganda, for instance. And they say, we don't even know what you're talking about. We don't want anybody thinking that this is an acceptable lifestyle. We don't want to see this in the newspaper. So there's a strong cultural aversion to even legitimizing homosexuality. So if you wanted to do a topic like that, and you were a researcher in Uganda, you might find that even your institution doesn't want to put its name on that thesis because there could be some, some pushback that could be uncomfortable for the institution. So you need to make sure that your topic is culturally acceptable. If, to do your research, you need to fly to Vietnam to talk about trade negotiations between Rwanda and Vietnam, nobody's paying for you to go to Vietnam. You know, unless you just got a special fellowship last year or a special scholarship or you won a prize that's going to allow you to go and you want to take advantage of the prize and get field research for your thesis. If that was true, first of all, I want to be your supervisor because that sounds outstanding. That sounds great. It's so unusual that a Rwandan would have a way for just a short period of time, expenses paid, to go to another place and get data on the ground in another country and bring it right back for the thesis, I'd love to be the supervisor of that thesis. So if one of you is in that situation, you can talk to me. But it's not going to happen very often. In fact, what's much more likely is you would say, I've got an obstacle that's created by the cost of having to get to where my data is or where my informants are. Or if you said, I want to follow every step of the coltan supply chain and see how I could make it more efficient, you need to get on a truck from here to Mombasa. You need to get on a ship from Mombasa to Malaysia. You need to go inland to a smelter. All the steps that we went through in our course, you would have to follow that coltan that was mined right here in Rwanda all the way through to where it ends up being plopped into a Dell laptop as a capacitor. You don't have the money. So it's not an affordable option, as much as it might be an interesting project. And you would have to eliminate that one from consideration. Next is, the project has to be something that you are capable of doing. As you get to the point where you're writing your thesis, you do not have the luxury of saying, gee, I think I'd like to teach myself COBOL programming language. Yeah, I'd like to teach myself uh, XBasic or you know, whatever, whatever you know, C++ so that I can do a program that will allow me to do this manipulation. I think I need to learn SPSS too, yeah. No, you don't have the time to be learning new computer languages when this is right around the corner that you're going to have to have this done. So you need to think about whether you already possess the skills that will allow you to basically analyze your data and write a questionnaire and do your research with existing skills. Hopefully the courses you're taking now, that's why we're having this class in June, you still have the summer to maybe get some skills, but once you get underway, full, full steam ahead with this project, you don't have time to learn new skills. Very tiny skills, but not anything bigger than that. So you have to be realistic about whether what you want to do requires maybe doing linear programming, and you don't know how to do linear programming, or it requires differential calculus, and you don't know differential calculus. If it requires skills that you don't have, you probably need to reformulate your product or your, your idea. So those are some of the things you need to think about when you're talking about dual. Just to go back a slide, remember I'm saying these are the factors to consider when you're coming up with your idea. What should my topic be? What can it be realistically? And this one about dual has all of these elements in it that you need to think about. And your topic needs to meet that test of all of these, and probably some more that I haven't thought of. Are there any that I've left out? Class? Any that you can think of that ought to be on that list? Of ways of screening an idea to see whether or not it stands up to the test? Yes, sir. Why is this a question about document availability? It's like, uh, do we have like uh, periods 
to say like the documents should be available for like how many years in the past so to be acceptable for, uh, for, for research. I can have a topic about let's say RGB, but RGB, RGB is like how many years? Uh, Only three before that was Riega. Yeah, is it acceptable? Is it reliable to base to be uh, my research to be based on the three years uh, old uh, data? Sure. You might say your topic is what was the power struggle when <coughs> Riega was reorganized as RGB. Because you know it brought in RDB IT, it brought in the, the, the many different offices. All came under the new umbrella of RDB when it was created. This human resource thing. There were pieces that became part of RDB that had never been part of Riepa before. The Rwanda Export Investment Promotion Agency that uh, the, the current uh, personal private secretary to the president used to head. So if you said my topic is about that power struggle. There were new people. Remember, first there was Joe Ritchie, the American, who was the head. And after Joe Ritchie, then there was John Gara. But you know, maybe Gatera wanted to stay, and maybe Gara was brought in. He was an outsider. He was new blood. They wanted the American because he was on the president's advisory council, but he didn't work out because he was always rude to so many Rwandans. You could write a good thesis about that one year, 2008 to 2009. You don't have to use documents that go back any earlier, but you're using every document and every interview where all the people are still alive, they're still in Rwanda. You could write a fascinating paper about that topic. Now, what you might end up with at the end is a history. Are we in the business of writing history in this, in this school? The answer is no. So you would have to have some angle that says this is a way not to have a smooth transition in public agencies. And there are lessons for how other public agencies that get reorganized could do better, could learn from the mistakes made in the change from RIEPA to RDB so that they do it better themselves. Now you've got a management topic. If you just said, let me tell you the history of this changeover, it's a history topic. And probably your supervisor would say, you need to show more how the lessons learned here could be applied in other managerial settings. So you need to give it a particular emphasis. But you don't need any more documents than the last three or four years. It would be definitely a, a topic that I think would be accepted. And it could be a very interesting one. Other questions there? No? Okay. So, a theoretical framework. You will often see, and you'll even find in your manual, if you haven't yet looked at it, let me just make a little advertisement saying, that manual is just 42 pages. It's the equivalent of one evening's reading in most universities. Now, I know that your students hate to read. And I know that even when you're assigned things to read, you usually don't read them. But there is a huge direct correlation between understanding what is required of you by MSM. It's all laid out in that manual. And the grade you will receive. And how easily you get that grade. You might ultimately get a good grade, but if you had to rewrite four times to get there, you will be in tears ready to gouge your eyes out and chop off the head of your supervisor. There's an easier way. Read the manual. 42 pages, that's all it is. Some of it is big graphs and tables, so there are only 40 pages of text. Read the 40 pages, read the manual. It is the textbook for this course. Read the manual. Please, read the manual. And in the manual, it will say that it's best to start big and narrow. Start big and then narrow down. Burrow down, get smaller. And what they mean by the start big is, let's talk about what theories that are already exposed, that are already known, that are already documented, is your topic going to fight against? If you're going to say, I'm just giving you more of the same, you have not added to knowledge on planet Earth. You haven't made a contribution to the body of knowledge. You need to say, I've got some new insight. I've got a new way of either doing this, a new methodology, or 
I'm looking at the method that people used before, but they forgot to take this into consideration. So it's a new kind of analysis to an existing methodology. You've got to do something new. Which is why case studies tend to be particularly, um, what will I say, unsuccessful in our program. A lot of people say, I want to do the case study of uh, BNR and why BNR was able to help bring banking to the rural poor. I want to do the case study of the Braliwa IPO. A case study doesn't really work all that well because all you're looking at now is history. This is what happened on the first day. This is what happened on the second day. This is what happened on the third day. There's no learning. There's no so what. There's no generalizable outcome that you can say, and this can now be applied in that industry and that industry, and it will make those industries perform better. You're just telling a story. You're just telling history. That's why case studies tend to play very weakly. They don't tend to have strong finishes and allow the students to get good grades. If you take a look at the history of master's theses in the MSM program here at SFB, case study theses very rarely get honors grades. The ones that do are ones where somebody has said, here's a, a, an interesting topic. It's not a case study really. It's I'm, I'm digging deep into something new in a wholly different in a whole different way. And let me tell you about it. Uh, some of you know Rose Baguma. She's the head of career services and a professor of marketing here at SFB. So, was it two years ago or three years ago? Do you remember when she defended? Was it two years ago? Yes. She did a great thesis. And, I, and I'm mentioning it not because you know she's somebody of mine or something, but because in our little tiny library that only has about 3,000 volumes, one thing that it happens to have is every single thesis that has ever come from any SFB student. So you can actually go and take a look at all of the theses that have ever been written and accepted. And hers was a great one. I mean, she got a you know, high honor. She got a 94 or something like this. I mean, she got, it was very, very good. And it was all on traditional medicine, uh, sellers of traditional medicine in, in, in Kigali. So, you know, there are little shops where you can go inside and they'll give you a skunk tail and it's supposed to give you potency when you were impotent. And, you can take the eye of an owl and you rub it on your eyes and if you were blind you could see again. All this traditional, it was a very interesting thing. Because this is a business and there are people in Rwanda who pay a lot of money believing that all these things work. You know, you cut off the foot of a cow and rub it on the baby when it has screaming and won't go to sleep at night and then the baby will be silent. Well, does it work or not? Are they charging market prices? Are they using fake ingredients? All that. She went into every aspect of this thing. A totally unresearched topic. Nobody had ever studied it before. Certainly not from a business point of view. Maybe a bit from the ethnographic point of view, but this is a business. And some people go into it not knowing anything about the business, and they just hang a few dead birds in front of the door, and they say, I'm in business. And there are actually Rwandans who come and pay money because there's a dead bird hanging in front of the door. So it was a fascinating thesis. Anyway, I encourage you to take a look at it. It is in our library. But it was partly because it wasn't just a history of an event, but it was saying, this is a way that people make money in Rwanda. This is how they use the information. This is how they promise results and how people believe that they've been cured by these things, even when it's not true. I mean, it was psychology, it was marketing, it was, it was everything. Oh, it was a great thesis. Very, very interesting. And she got the thesis prize that year for the best, best thesis or best MBA student, I forget, some prize. But she did very well, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Anyway, back to theory. You need to start with theory. You start big, and you borrow down. So, what is theory? The theory is what's been done before. It's been done before because some people have said, this is the way it should be done. Our theory of cause and effect, our theory of what happens when you do this, our theory of what causes inflation is, we work in a world of theories. Theories are the best arguments that we have from our smartest people of how we should do things and why the world behaves the way it does. Those are our theories. Your job is either to create a new theory, add into the body of knowledge that way, or disprove an existing theory. And I love those. When you take people who think they're smart and show that they weren't and show that you're smarter, those are the best theses of all. That's even better than coming up with a new theory. 
if you can disprove somebody else's. But those are your two approaches. But in order to disprove somebody's theory, you still need to first understand their theory. Only by understanding it can you say, here's where I found the hole in it. This is where they were sloppy. This is where they made an assumption that is just absolutely not true, and no one ever caught it before. So, you need to understand something about theory. Hold on here, technical changes. Let me try to get this thing to work. And then what did you do to the What did this have to do with this?